Before I'm joined by Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray, some news. Earlier this week, it was reported that a group of 60 bishops, led by Cardinal Wilton Gregory, wrote to Archbishop Jose Gomez, pressing him to suspend the Eucharistic coherence discussion ahead of the Catholic bishops' June meeting. This discussion is merely to discuss whether the bishops would draft a document on the reception of communion and whether public figures who defy church teaching should be receiving the Eucharist. Joining me now to share his insights on the matter and tell us why he supports that discussion is the shepherd of the Diocese of Springfield, Illinois, Bishop Thomas Paprocki. Your Excellency, thank you for being here. Uh, there was, in that letter signed by 67 bishops or so, they are requesting that Archbishop Jose Gomez suspend the aforementioned discussion. They write, Having now received the May 7, 2021 letter from His Eminence Luis F. Cardinal Ladaria, Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, we respectfully urge that all conference-wide discussion and committee work on the topic of Eucharistic worthiness and other issues raised by the Holy See be postponed until the full body of bishops is able to meet in person. The high standard of consensus among ourselves and of maintaining unity with the Holy See and the Universal Church, as set forth by Cardinal Ladaria, is far from being achieved in the present moment. Moreover, as the prefect's sound theological and pastoral advice opens a new path for moving forward, we should take this opportunity to re-envision the best collegial structure for achieving that. Bishop Paprocki, what did you think when you first heard about this letter? Well, it's rather puzzling because Cardinal Ladaria calls for uh, a two-step process. First, there should be dialogue among the bishops, and then secondly, uh, dialogue with uh, uh, politicians. And actually, that's been going on for some time. This goes back at least to 2004, when John Kerry was running for president, a Catholic uh, running for president. And we had quite a bit of discussion then. And over the years, there have been actually quite a uh, quite a bit of conversation going on with politicians. But it's also puzzling because the letter from the 60 or so uh, bishops uh, to Archbishop Gomez calls for a total suspension of all committee work on this. And that would seem to be exactly counter uh, to what the idea is of having some dialogue. So the proposal at this point is simply to have a vote at our June meeting uh, whether or not to be drafting a document on Eucharistic yeah. coherence and then have a discussion in November when the full body of bishops is present in person. So I, I understand the, the goal there. It's very important that when we have that uh, final uh, debate and amendment process and vote, uh, that that should be in person, and that's what's planned for November. But in order to have a document for us to look at, the committee work has to continue. And so we need to push forward with this in, in June. You and many of your fellow bishops, including Archbishop Cordelione of San Francisco, Archbishop Aquila of, of Denver, Archbishop Nauman of Kentucky, have been critical of bishops who've tried to derail this discussion by working the back channels in Rome. In a statement on Wednesday, you wrote, sadly, there are some bishops and cardinals of the church who not only are willing to give Holy Communion to pro-abortion politicians, but who seek to block the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops from addressing the question of Eucharistic coherence. Why do you think are some bishops looking to stop this discussion? Well, because I, I think they just don't want to face this issue, which is actually uh, something that is is uh, very uh, longstanding in our tradition. It goes back to the early church. In fact, St. Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians that whoever eats unworthily of the bread and drinks from the Lord's cup makes himself guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Uh, and we understand that to mean that if you receive uh, Holy Communion in the state of mortal sin, you're actually committing another mortal sin. Uh, you're committing the sin of sacrilege. And so it's, it's not like uh, we're, we're making something up here that's new, uh, nor are we simply being legalistic with it. This is a longstanding uh, tradition of the Church and uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, what it means to be properly disposed to receive Holy Communion. Incidentally, none of the bishops or cardinals, uh, Tobin, Supich, Gregory, O'Malley, none of them who signed that letter put out statements. Uh, and the letter to Archbishop Gomez was not made public. It was leaked. Even if all the bishops were to agree that a pro-abortion politician could not receive communion, 
they can't compel another bishop to deny communion to anybody. So why has this become such a polarizing issue for some bishops to even discuss at a meeting with other bishops? Well, there are some who would want to say that the only ones who have any say on this matter are the, the bishops uh, of where a person has a domicile. Uh, so, for example, mm -hmm. uh, currently that would be the Archbishop of Washington because uh, the president lives in the White House. Uh, but the fact is that uh, President Biden is traveling around the country, I would think, going to communion in different uh, churches and different dioceses. It does pertain to the bishop of that diocese to make uh, a determination about whether or not Holy Communion should be, uh, should be given. So it does pertain to every bishop. It would be certainly very, be very helpful if we had a consensus on this uh, around the country. This is not really, I would argue, this is not an optional matter. It's not a question of discretion of whether or not we want to do this. Uh, I think canon law is clear on this. And, and again, I think church teaching is clear on this. It's based on biblical teaching. Mm -hmm. So it, this is not something that's being done arbitrarily, but I think it's being uh, true to our tradition of what it means to be uh, properly disposed to receive Holy Communion. And the idea of Eucharistic coherence also goes back to, that's actually a phrase that uh, came out of Latin America in a document in 2007 by the bishops of Latin America, where uh, uh, they said that uh, addressing this to legislators, heads of government, and health uh, professionals, they said that we must adhere to a Eucharistic coherence, that is, be conscious that they cannot receive Holy Communion and at the same time act with deeds or words against the commandments, particularly when abortion, euthanasia, and other grave crimes against life and the family are encouraged. And I would also note that that document at the time it was passed, uh, included uh, Cardinal uh, Jorge Bergoglio, the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. He was a, a major architect of that document and, and often speaks of it as guiding his pastoral ministry. So I would, I would assume that being the case, that uh, uh, certainly Pope Francis would want us to adhere to Eucharistic coherence, and that's why we need to address that issue in our country. Yeah, that uh, Parasida uh, document that you referenced there. He was a, a Cardinal Bregoglio, and now Pope Francis was instrumental in shaping that document. You're right, he constantly mentions it uh, as almost a, a guidepost throughout his pontificate, he has. The USCCB president, Jose Gomez, has not taken the topic of Eucharistic coherence off the agenda for the upcoming meeting. What do you expect to come out of this discussion next month? What I... What I expect to come out of this discussion is uh, that uh, we will get approval to move forward for the committees to continue uh, to work. The Committee on Doctrine be actually drafting a document with uh, consultation with other committees, for example, the Committee on Canonical Affairs and Church Governance, of, of mm -hmm. which I am a member, and that they will then have a draft. And when that draft is, is proposed, then that would be the basis for further consultation. We always have a process where any bishop can submit amendments to a draft, and then there's a, a debate on the draft and a final vote, and that won't happen until uh, November. So I think for this process to go forward, I would also uh, add that I think it's very important that we uh, talk about this issue, not only in terms of uh, communion for politicians. Certainly the election of President Biden, a Catholic uh, who is pro-abortion, has given urgency to this issue. But we also know that uh, polls tell us that uh, apparently 70 percent or so Catholics don't believe in the real presence, or at least don't understand the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. We also see uh, occasions where uh, Catholics who are divorced and remarried without an annulment are going to communion or they're cohabiting. Uh, so there, there are other situations besides that of politicians. And so, and the document, I understand, will address uh, not just the question of Holy Communion for politicians who are pro-abortion, but I think the whole idea of Eucharistic coherence applies to everybody, that uh, there should be a coherence. In other words, that there should be consistency between our beliefs uh, and, and the way we live our lives. Bishop Paprocki, thank you for the insight. We will, of course, be watching in the days ahead to see how this conversation proceeds. Thank you for being here. And here with in-depth analysis of all of this and much more is the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org and St. John Henry Newman visiting chair at Thomas More College, Robert Royal, and from Manhattan, canon lawyer, priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Chance, thanks for being here. Uh, I want to get your reaction to this 60-plus bishops 
and the Cardinals trying to stymie a bishop's discussion on Eucharistic coherence. What did you think of what Bishop Paprocki just said? Father Jerry. Uh, Bishop Paprocki was right on target. Uh, it's really shocking that uh, Cardinal Gregory and others uh, would try to shut down a discussion just after Cardinal Ladaria from Rome uh, gave guidelines on how to conduct that discussion. Uh, and it should be noted that those guidelines were a rather unusual intervention of the doc Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in discussion of an issue that really hasn't even been discussed yet. Uh, so uh, the idea that you wouldn't want to talk about things that are of vital importance for the bishops and the people of the United States, uh, very troubling. And I thought uh, Bishop Aprocki put it very well. This is not something uh, that is new. We've known about this problem of prominent Catholics who support abortion and yet continue to receive Holy Communion. It uh, goes way back, uh, and it should be dealt with forthrightly. And as he also said, it's not an optional matter. Uh, canon law regulates mm -hmm. this. Theology teaches the truth. So I'm glad uh, to hear that he and hopefully most bishops will support going on with the discussion. Mm. Bob, your thoughts. And, and Father Jerry really struck a, a point with me. The bishops are all too eager to discuss climate change statements and racism statements and, you know, all these kind of, uh, though important, tertiary concerns to bishops. This runs to the very heart and soul of what it means to be Catholic and their job. Yeah, it's, for me, it's quite curious that we have a, a regular structure in the USCCB that establishes these um, schedules, the, the, the way that they're going to put an agenda together to talk about certain issues. And, you know, many things go, go on to the agenda, and some go forward and some don't. The, the way that this group, and we know that Cardinal Supic and I think Tobin were over in Rome, seeking mm -hmm. to kind of put a block on even this, this very preliminary discussion of a, of a key issue, it goes outside the, the regular procedures of the, the, what our American bishops have established themselves. There's no problem going to this meeting and saying, you know, I don't like the way this is going. I think we ought to consider uh, something else. But the very fact that they place so much importance on not even beginning a discussion, to me, says that there's something quite wrong here. And we know, I, you know, no disrespect to Cardinal uh, Supic, for example, but we know that Cardinal Supic has been nominated for various high posts in the USCCB. His fellow bishops have not elected him to those positions. And so instead, he's seeking to influence uh, our U.S. bishops by going to Rome and asking Rome to intervene in a, in a, in a papacy that likes to pride itself on, on seeking to decentralize what is going on in the church, to give a little bit more aut autonomy where that autonomy ought to exist in other places besides Rome. So to me, this is quite puzzling. And I, I, I think of it, I, I, I know there are many, many differences between these two things, but I think of it in a way like the the accord that the, the Vatican has signed with China. We know what China got out of that. We don't know what the church got out of it. What do mm -hmm. our bishops get out of this protection of democratic politicians and now a president who's a, a Catholic Democrat? What, what do they get? What does the church benefit from by, by entering into this kind of so-called dialogue with them? We know that this dialogue is not going to go anywhere on the key issues like abortion. What advantage is there to the church? What advantage is there to the evangelization of the truth that Christ asked us to proclaim? It's very, very puzzling. Mm. Uh, I want to move on to uh, the Pope's homily on the Feast of Pentecost, uh, where the Pope called on the church to reject ideologies of the left and the right. He said, if we listen to the Spirit, we are not to be concerned with conservatives and progressives, traditionalists and innovators, right and left. The paraclete impels us to unity, to concord, to the harmony of diversity. The enemy wants diversity to become opposition, and so he makes them become ideologies. Say no to ideologies, yes to the whole. What do you make of that? Uh, and who do you think the Pope was speaking to here, Father Jerry? Well, this language uh, that the Pope uses is uh, largely imposing a political set of categories on religious doctrine, and I don't think it's appropriate. I think it's the wrong analogy to use. Uh, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The sacred scriptures 
uh, record the revelation of God, and then the Gospels tell us exactly what Jesus taught. And one of the things he taught was that uh, to the apostles, he who hears you hears me. So the apostles mm. have a solemn role to teach what Jesus taught and then uh, to proclaim that teaching down the generations. Uh, that teaching is clear. That teaching has been developed and explained and explicated by uh, the popes and the councils over the centuries. Uh, so it's not as if we have different versions of the truth. There's one truth, and those that support it, uh, we could definitely say they're conservative because they're trying to conserve what was given by Christ to the apostles handed down to us. Uh, to make the category simply, well, innovators, uh, those who want to protect the past, reject both of them. No, those who protect the teaching of the church are the ones who are upholding uh, with the virtue, we could say, of fortitude, going against worldliness. Because remember, we don't exist in a bubble. Left-wing ideology has as one of its main categories the destruction of Christian truth because it's an obstacle to the accomplishment of their goals. Just look at it for two cases, abortion, uh, left-wing ideology says there's no baby there and you can kill it. The church teaches, no, we don't kill innocent people. And the other is marriage. Marriage is only between a man and a woman. Left-wing ideology, you don't get to set the rules. Marriage is whatever anybody wants to make of it, including two men marrying each other. Now, in that case, you can say people want to innovate, they want to destroy. People want to conserve, they want to preserve. Robert, I, I, during the opening ceremony or, uh, of the General Assembly of the Italian Episcopal Conference that took place this week, the Pope asked bishops to pay more attention to the training of seminarians. He had this to say regarding rigid seminarians. Listen to this. Abbiamo visto con frequenza seminaristi che sembravano buoni, ma rigidi e la rigidità non è del buono spirito e poi ci siamo accorti che dietro quella rigidità c'erano dei grossi problemi now th this is not the first time pope francis has lamented rigid seminarians or priests in 2019 in a meeting with jesuits in mozambique he said of clericalism clericalism has a direct consequence in rigidity have you never seen young priests in stiff black cassocks and hats in the shape of the planet Saturn on their heads? Behind all the rigid clericalism, there are serious problems. Bob, who is he really addressing here when he speaks about seminarians and priests this way? And what do you think he means by rigidity? Well, I've said this before in, in our other uh, shows, but I, I really think this reflects some autobiographical element on his part. He has said that in the past, when, when he was a, a young priest himself and when he was the leader of the Jesuits in Argentina, that he was, he was too authoritarian and maybe he was too rigid himself. And maybe he's overly sensitive to that. But I think any person looking around the, the universal church in the world at this moment in history, you know, are there rigid seminarians? Yes, of course there are. There are rigid seminarians, we might also say, of the left as well as of the, of the right, to go back to this idea of ideologies that, that he also was denouncing. But I think most of us, and I know a lot of recently uh, ordained priests, uh, I think that most of them I would know would probably be drawn from more traditional circles than, than uh, in general. And I can't say that I find that uh, there's a kind of an unbalanced or a pathological rigidity there. I see a lot of that desire to preserve that Father Murray was talking about. There is no social advantage to being a priest in most places these days, at least in the developed world. So people who are going to become priests in Europe and the United States and Australia and other such countries, they do this because of their love of the gospel, their desire to, to preach the good news about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I can't see that as rigidity. I, I, what I can see that is, is it's going to bring them into contact with the world, a conflict with the world. But as Jesus himself said, you know, the world has hated me, so it's going to hate you. He's warned people ab about yeah. this. True followers are going to find themselves in conflict with the world. So, look, if, it, if this is a worry of his because of his own autobiographical history, I understand that. It just doesn't seem to me to reflect very much the the situation of the church in the world at this moment.
No, it's a, I agree with you. There's something biographical in it. It seems a holdover from some experience in Latin America that, that you know, the Pope is trying to apply to the whole church. But, and this is a good tie-in. There are some reports in Italian media that during this Italian Episcopal Conference, Pope Francis announced plans to reform the worst of Benedict XVI's motto proprio, Samorum Pontificum. Now, that touches on uh, loosening up the regulations regarding celebration of the Latin Mass or the Mass in the extraordinary form. Uh, it, this was liberated by uh, Benedict the Sixteenth. Father Jerry, what do you make of this news, and what would it mean to priests who want to say the Mass in the in the Roman form, in the extraordinary form? Well, it's been verified, uh, confirmed that the Pope did speak about. Uh, these upcoming changes to Samorum Pontificum, exactly what they will result in is not quite clear. But we know the usual complaint that has been coming into Rome, which is that bishops that don't like the old mass, the Tridentine mass, they're frustrated because through Samorum Pontificum, any priest, any pastor can celebrate that mass at his own decision in his mm -hmm. parish and invite the faithful to come. And um, as we've seen over the past number of years, this has been a very successful and fruitful pastoral move by Pope Benedict because people that love the traditional Mass and they love the beauty of the Latin language and the solemnity, they're able to peacefully and joyfully pray and uh, it's resulted in a flourishing of vocation. I find it very ironic uh, that, uh, you know, within a few weeks of the German priests blessing homosexual couples, uh, the Pope, unfortunately, seems to have this idea that the real problems in the church are pathological conservative seminarians and people like the Latin Mass. Um, I think that's the wrong approach. I think the Pope needs to broaden his vision. Uh, he may not like the old Mass, and that's fine. No one's asking him to say it. But please, let people who want to say the old Mass, the priests, and let the faithful want to hear it, uh, mm -hmm. let them come in peace. I mean, isn't that the kind of uh, pastoral charity that the, the shepherds of the church should exercise? Bob, according to reports, Pope Francis says the ben that Benedict XVI liberalized the extraordinary form of the Mass only to satisfied Lefebvreites, people who had left the faith, you know, and be because of the changes in Vatican II. Now, in Benedict's own words, he had this to say about his motto proprio in his book Last Testament. The rehabilitation of the ancient mass with Samorum Pontificum must absolutely not be understood as a concession to the society of St. Pius X, but as a way for the whole church to be one with herself inwardly, with her own past, that what was previously holy in her is not somehow wrong now. It was certainly not as though there would now be another mass. They are two different forms of one and the same right. Your thoughts on this, and why would Francis suggest that Benedict wrote this to satisfy, you know, the, the, the folks in uh, St. Pius X? Well, uh, I, w I think that that's a, a f reflection of a, a lot of the people that he has around them. I think they probably regard that as uh, a, a uh, move in, within Europe to bring the, uh, the, the, uh, the Lefebvreites closer uh, back to the church. But this pope has tried to do that as well. He's also reached out to different factions in, in, the, in the church, to different segments in the church. Look, the, the fundamental thing here is this. That is the, the long-time liturgy of the universal church. And for me, I'm old enough to remember the, the Latin Mass. I grew up with it. Um, before I knew Latin myself, and people used to, you know, we all have done this, you've got a, a missile that's got English on one side and Latin on the other side. So um, you can, you know, you can work your way through the Latin. What's the alternative when there are un universal celebrations, let's say uh, a canonization or a special event? The alternative is that's going to be in some um, vernacular language. And in Rome, that's probably going to mean Italian, which it's a nice language to learn. I myself have learned it, but it's not the case that universally, when you have large numbers of people coming from all over the world, they're going to know Italian. That mm -hmm. Latin has been a source of unity, and it's it's one of those um, it's one of those elements in the church that actually is not ideological, or does not have to be ideological. It doesn't have to be a going back. It can be a, a, a ressourcement. It can be a rediscovery of the sources 
that enable us to go forward in the church. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me that this is an element of unity, and the Pope has been looking for elements of unity. Uh, I think to characterize this as, as somehow a sectarian move is a mistake, and it could be very useful. It's very, it's a, we know that here in the United States, there's a, a lot of interest in, in, by young people in going to, to more traditional masses. And yeah. I, I think we let a hundred flowers bloom and see where the spirit is blowing at this point. Yeah. Uh, it, Father Jerry, it has been announced Archbishop Arthur Roach will replace Cardinal Sarah as the prefect at the Vatican Congregation for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments. Now, uh, Roche, it should be said, has a kind of negative view of uh, the traditional Mass, the Tridentine Mass. In fact, he's written uh, a solely clerical version of the liturgy, is how he characterizes it, in which the clergy alone are active and faithful are passive. Um, your thoughts on this appointment? Well, he was the uh, secretary, so he was the number two under Cardinal Sarah, so he mm -hmm. certainly uh, has experience now working in that department. It remains to be seen uh, what he will do. Uh, we have two other officials who were appointed, a new secretary and a new undersecretary, so it's sort of a new lineup being put in there under mm -hmm. uh, Archbishop Roach. Um, you know, the Latin Mass does not fall under the jurisdiction of the uh, Congregation for Divine Worship. It falls under Ecclesia Dei Commission, which is part mm -hmm. of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. So he will not have direct responsibility for it. I will say this, though, to characterize uh, the participation of lay people in the Latin Mass as simply passive uh, is to miss something profound, uh, which is the movement of prayer in the soul and the action of the Holy Spirit uh, through the whole sacramental action, the, the readings, the consecration, and the administration of the sacraments. Mm -hmm. there's not, it's, it's not passive to enter into God's drama of grace uh, renewed at the Mass. And uh, I said the Latin Mass myself many times. Uh, lay people do respond at some points. And really, one of the highest forms of participation is not talking, but listening, believing, and then nourishing mm -hmm. your soul on what's going on. That is a profound participation. So I think it's it's a mistake to call it simply a passive uh, participation. I only, I only have five minutes. Bob, I want to get you and Father's reaction to this. Father James Altman, the pastor of St. James the Less Parish in La Crosse, has been asked by his bishop, William Callahan, to resign. Now, Father Altman made a name for himself online with a rather explosive video that was distributed last year. He claimed that no Catholic could be a Democrat because of the party's leadership and its support of abortion. And in his parish bulletin, he wrote that COVID-19 vaccines are experimental, and he warned parishioners not to be guinea pigs. Uh, in his homily posted online this weekend, Father Altman had this to say when being asked to resign. They want my head now for speaking that truth because I am divisive, as they like to say, or as the bishop himself has stated, I am ineffective as a pastor. So for the record, dear family, Bishop Callahan has asked me to resign as pastor as of this past Friday. What do you make of what Father Altman said there, uh, Robert? Well, look, in, in a way, what we see in him is the anger that many people feel that our bishops don't seem to be taking seriously where the Democratic Party is leading the country. And it's uh, especially painful because we have a president and the Speaker of the House who are Catholics and make a point of telling us that they're Catholics. They're leading us in a, in a, a bad direction. And so I think the, the followers of Father Altman, when he made that first statement, now it's a rhetorical statement, obviously. You can be a Catholic and a Democrat, and I wish there were more real Catholics who were Democrats. I wish that inside the party there are groups that are pro-life and pro-family. I wish there were a larger segment of them who were there. But just you know, stating that as a kind of a rhetorical statement, it really put on the national consciousness, Catholic consciousness, the idea that there's something profoundly wrong, and so I understand that. Unfortunately, yeah. I think he's also gone off into some language that I wish he or any priest would just avoid. I mean, he's talked about abortionists as vermin, uh, baby-killing vermin, and he's talked about pansy babies who are whining about what, what he says. I, I think this is unnecessary, that, that it actually d diminishes the impact that he could have. 
and I, mm. I think that some of the, his statements about the vaccines are, to my mind, a little bit, um, let, let's say, extreme. That there are doubts to be had about the effectiveness of the vaccines. There are certainly moral questions to be raised. But he's talked about it altering your DNA, and there is really no scientific evidence. I've tried to look into this. and. Every yeah. time the argument and is the made. CD, I mean, and the CDC does say, you know, this is a, an emergency. Right. It's, it's really right. under their emergency request. And these are, these are experimental vaccines right. in that sense. But they have been tested. And, you know, you have to just be careful about the way you characterize right. them. So, look, my, my take on this is he, he did some important things at the beginning. I think that he and everybody who wants to have a public voice in the United States should focus on those main things. And some of the, these other things that are more divisive, we can leave for, you know, some later debate. What, what uh, we really need to focus on now are the things that our bishops should be talking about in June and then again in the fall. And that is, we have to get, get clear that if we cannot make a strong statement about our commitment to life, family, all those issues that the modern world does not like, and apply them actively to people in high public positions in the United mm -hmm. States, then I don't know what the church really says that's all that effective. We can talk about poverty, we can talk about refugees, we can talk Bob. about climate, but everybody's talking about that stuff. Bob, I've I got to get Father in before I run out of time. Uh, this request for Father Altman's uh, resignation comes in the same week we see Father Michael Flager reinstated in Chicago and other priests making all kinds of wacky statements online, in public, on, uh, at seminars. Why single this priest out, Father Jerry? And, and is there a danger here? And, and, and is this according to canon law? Can, can the bishop do this? Well, um, the bishop can ask a pastor to resign. Uh, that is uh, some, that's a request he can make. And if the pastor resigns, then it's there, there it is. If the bishop wants to transfer him to another parish uh, and the pastor does not volunteer to that transfer, then he has to undergo a canonical process in which the bishop has to state his reasons. Uh, so it is reasonable for the bishop to use canon law to transfer pastors. Uh, the broader issue is, uh, why did it come to this point? Uh, we don't know the whole history of the dealings between Father Altman and his bishop, and I do agree with Bob uh, and this, you know, that some of these statements were imprudent and provocative and should not have been made. Um, but, you know, without full knowledge of the total dealings between the two, it would be wrong to draw definitive conclusions that one is acting wrongly and the bishop acting wrongly or that father is defending himself uh, in the way he should. Now, on the broader mm -hmm. question, I'll just add this, Raymond. What's really on trial here in the United States right now in the Catholic Church is, do we represent Jesus Christ and his teaching or do we represent another interest group seeking to get favors from the federal government. Uh, and it sounds awfully like the second when we can't get our bishops to forthrightly tell the President of the United States, you cannot receive communion if you are paying for and abor praying for the abortion of children and doing everything you can to keep it legal. That is a total contradiction of your obligation as a Catholic. And that obligation, by the way, is not to me, to you, to any bishop, it's to Jesus Christ. That's what we be should be talking about. Gentlemen, we will leave it there. Thank you for the commentary, and you can find more of it, both Robert Royal and Father Jerry, at thecatholicthing.org. Thank you both.